They're going to have at least a foot up top out of this car. Oh, it does look like it's snow. I kind of like the snow. Yeah. Uh, that's another reason for the picture. We, we, like, we like the snow. We like the outdoor. Yeah. All right. Fairly good for you. you uh, all right, so we're going to move on out of the pituitary, and we're going to talk about thyroid, and we're going to get through a couple of other organs. We're going to finish on diabetes mellitus, as it refers to the pancreas. All right, so with the thyroid gland, hyperthyroidism with the thyroid gland is called uh, thyrotoxicosis, another name for it. And primary hypothyroidism is referred to as Graves' disease. Do you guys remember Graves' disease? I put this sort of annoying question like, what was that again? So Graves' disease was a type of hypersensitivity that we looked at. Do you remember which one it was? It was type 2, nicely done. So that, that's an other kind of flashback, cumulative review type of question. This is a type 2 hypersensitivity where the thyroid is overactive and it's caused by autoantibodies, autoantibodies that bind to the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor on the thyroid and turn it on. So even though the pituitary is not telling the thyroid to do anything, you make autoantibodies that tell the thyroid to do something all by itself. Okay, type 2 hypersensitivity. So that's very common way to see or manifestation of hyperthyroidism. Another one would be considered a, what we call a toxic goiter. A toxic goiter could be either a single or a multi-nodule, uh, and um, this is a swelling of the thyroid gland. Um, these nodules are usually um, uh, adenoma-like, so it's kind of, you know, uh, a little Weird to say, well, the third class is called adenoma. What's the difference between an adenoma and a toxic goiter? Usually a goiter um, is um, in a situation where it's definitely enlarging. And so you're getting this uh, um, uh, a toxic goiter that's taking place over time. The thyroid itself swells and enlarges. Multinodule type. Now the last one could just be a basic adenoma causing hyperthyroidism where it's not a goiter that continues to grow. It's just an adenoma that stays in place and it, it, every six months you get it looked at every year and it's about the same size as it was last year. So you wouldn't consider that a toxic goiter because it's not progressing. It would be classified as just an adenoma. So that would be the difference between those two categories. All right, so those are all primary ways you can have hyperthyroidism. A secondary way would be um, this access type of question, and I like to ask these kinds of questions on the exam, because it tells me if you really understand how this is all set up. But this access secondary mechanism is if you have hyperthyroid stimulated hormone release from the pituitary. So it's really a primary pituitary issue causing a secondary thyroid issue. Make sense? So let's look at an example. Um, this picture of this young individual, you can see the date that's uh, being broadcasted on that image. Uh, so it's 2008, it's July 7th, 2008. It's the seventh day, uh, it, so that you would read that, you'll see it next, seventh day of the seventh month of the 2008 year. Um, so this individual, and this little neck charm is actually important for you guys to, uh, to see. Uh, this is a severe thyrotoxicosis pa patient, primary hypothyroidism. Um, and the treatment that, we, that was used, that was used here, is uh, a thyrostatic drug known as carbimazole. C-A-R-B-I-M-A-Z-O-L-E. Thyrostatic drug. It's not really all that important that you know the name of the drug. I don't care, you know, I don't, I don't get any bonus points for talking about, you know, I'm not sponsored by drug companies, okay? It's not like I gotta mention Mountain Dew or Taco Bell in my speech. 
But this particular drug is called carbimazole, if you care to know. It's a thyrostatic drug. There are many other types of thyrostatic drugs. So this patient, um, in December 29th of 2008, right? It's outside the U.S. the way the date looks is different, but it's the 29th day of the 12th month of the 2008 year. And you can see the dramatic change in this young boy. Um, and this little neck charm is kind of the scale bar. Right, to give you an appreciation for how drastic of a change it took place uh, for, this, for this individual. So um, as we move on with hyperthyroidism, if we look at um, one main cause of it, thyrotoxicosis being the first one, the second one being Graves' disease, right? This is autoantibodies to thyroid stimulating hormone type 2 hypersensitivity. Um, so we've got some clinical manifestations that take place in Graves' disease patients. They're a little different than this thyrotoxicosis patient that you saw. Um, we get um, hyperplasia and enlargement of the thyroid. We see um, kind of a rare symptom, which is a um, uh, dermopathy uh, lesion or a skin irritation, and you're seeing a picture of that here. So this is pre-tibial myxedemia, where you're getting this redness and this skin irritation that looks like a ginormous rash. A little bit more rare of a, of, of a disorder. Um, the one that's actually more common is this um, eye disease. This eye disease is called exophthalmus. Uh, this eye disease where you've got this patient looking um, um, with bulging-like eyes, okay? And the bulgy type of eyes with this eye disease, this exophthalmus, um, is very characteristic of, of, of a thyroid um, problem from Graves' disease. Now, the other thing that you're going to see that you saw in that first patient, you can see rapid weight loss. Um, you see an increase in basal metabolic rate. You see um, sleeplessness. They, they have a rapid heart rate. Um, and um, high uh, metabolism, and so it's hard for them to fall asleep at night, okay? Because metabolism is so high, why they lose so much weight as well? Graves disease patients. So this is showing you the exact same figure that we looked at with type 2 hypersensitivity. So this is our thyroid epithelial cell. Here's an antibody that's manufactured, binds to the thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone normally would come down from the anterior pituitary and hit the thyroid gland binding here and then release T3 and T4. But in Graves' disease, the patient manufactures antibodies towards the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor and it activates it all by itself without the presence of, um, of the actual thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, hypothyroidism, weight gain instead of weight loss. So weight gain with thyrotoxicosis or Graves' disease, weight loss with hypothyroidism. Um, the primary ways that this manifests itself is um, with an autoimmune disease where there's an anti-thyroid antibody that's being made, different than Graves, that's with this TSA receptor. Um, uh, thyroidosis or itis, where it's usually a bacterial infection of the thyroid gland that destroys a component of the thyroid gland. Um, endemic goiters, where the, um, the, the thyroid gland as an organ needs iodine in order to operate. And in some um, countries, where iodine is not a readily available source in the diet, the thyroid will respond by enlarging. And what it's doing is it's trying to get bigger so it can make enough thyroid hormone to keep homeostatic norms. But then the neck, you can see these endemic waters in these third world countries, usually where there's lots of starvation, you see this happening, and they'll get these very large endemic waters. Okay. And that's not, the, that's not a good sign. That means the goiter, uh, the thyroid itself, is enlarging to try to manufacture enough hormone uh, because there's not enough iodine in the diet. But where do you get iodine from? Uh, you get it from seafood. You get it from like tuna and cod. You get it from seaweed. You get it from eggs and milk. 
These are actually all very expensive foods. And most of us have plenty of this in our diet. Now, what do I feel like eating tonight? Right? Um, so there was a point in our country where um, um, we also struggled financially during the Great Depression. Right? And so there was a decision made in our country to um, create a source of iodine for Americans in a, in a supplement that everybody would get plenty of. Salt. So iodized salt was a byproduct of really out of the Great Depression uh, because we were having actual starvation happening in this country. And in order to curb the effects of, of endemic goiters from taking place, they decided to force all salt manufacturers to make iodized salt during that time. Now it's not, it's not, I don't think it's a requirement anymore. So you can, you can go to the grocery store and you can buy non-iodized salt versus iodized salt. One's good for your thyroid, the other one's not, right? That's the difference. Just, there is a price difference. Isn't there? In fact, uh, iodized salt's a little bit more expensive. So this is the most common type of thyroid malfunction, hypothyroidism. Too little. Um, if you overdo uh, thyrostatic drugs, like a carminazole, um, you can actually take the person from hyper to hypo. Okay, so that's also on the list, anti-thyroid drugs. Now, the secondary effects. There could be uh, a congenital defect in a patient where the thyroid doesn't form quite correctly. Uh, and so the result is the thyroid is not running the way it should. Um, or, if you go in and you surgically remove a component of the thyroid because of surgery um, and you take too much healthy tissue, now the patient might have gone from a hyper to a hypo. So that's another type of secondary um, uh, hyperthyroid uh, situation. You can see this patient had a pre and post therapy, uh, definitely heavier on the left, uh, less heavy on the right. Um, still has the same rock and glasses, so you can tell that um, from, a, from a scale bar standpoint, you can kind of relatively see the difference. Um, in these patients, um, some of the um, symptoms are going to be um, the opposite of what we saw with hyperthyroidism. So weight gain, um, you'll see a lowering of basal metabolic rate, you'll see um, uh, Tired, listless, uh, mental sluggishness, falling asleep in class all the time. I like to ask students if they're hypothyroid, that's why they're falling asleep in class. Um, so kind of the polar opposite of what you would see with hyper. Now, um, sort of a classic uh, example of a type of uh, hypothyroidism, this is the most common type of hypothyroidism called Hashimoto's disease. And I alluded to it, we were talking about Sheehan syndrome. This is a Japanese physician, Hashimoto Fukura, um, who first described these, uh, these symptoms, believe it or not, in a German publication, which I thought was kind of ironic. Um, and it's the most common uh, type of hyper, or hypo, excuse me, hypothyroidism. And what I want, the reason I like this slide is it talks about how the thyroid epithelium is destroyed with Hashimoto's disease. So in Hashimoto's disease, um, you've got T cell involvement. So what type of hypersensitivity is it? Type four. But you've got um, CD4 cells, you've got CD8 cytotoxic T cells, and you also get antibody production. But we call it a type four because it involves T cells, even though it manufactures antibodies and it utilizes T helper cells. All three of these mechanistic pathways lead to um, thyroid tissue destruction or injury. In this particular situation with CD4 helper T cells, you activate macrophages, and from an inflammatory pathway, you're destroying your thyroid tissue. Um, with CD8 cytotoxic T cells, these go through a cytolysis a type of apoptosis that we looked at before. And then again, with our antibodies that we're manufacturing, we signal them for destruction using an antibody-mediated uh, cytotoxicity. Again, um, all triggering around this helper T cell coming to the three different pathways that I just described. Okay, so in this particular young girl, we see some of the classic characteristics of hypo 
hypothyroidism. So uh, this is a congenital hypothyroidism, meaning there wasn't um, an infarct, there wasn't an adenoma, there wasn't a lesion. Uh, congenitally, this young girl developed with a thyroid that was underactive. And so we refer to this as creatinism in young patients. Congenital hypothyroidism is referred to as creatinism. Now, the symptoms are like what we described before, cold intolerant, right? <coughs> Low basal metabolic rate, so they feel cold all the time. Uh, they gain a lot of weight. There's a lot of edema. Uh, nothing's working quickly as it should, and so the GI tract is slower, and that leads to constipation. Um, you get a lot of um, uh, fluid in the tissues, and that includes within the pericardial space. So you get these pericardial fusions that surround the heart, which can be problematic because it can lead to heart problems if it's untreated. Now, you can see an untreated young girl on the left and the same treated girl on the right. Um, I don't know if those are the same underwear. That's the <laughs> way that you're going to be able to make, uh, make comparisons. Um, but you can kind of see her hair looks the same, right? She's kind of got that same uh, kind of wispy looking hair that's flowing up to give you a clue. So she's 10 years old in the untreated picture, right? And she um, has, uh, she's relatively overweight or obese for her age. Um, she has sort of immature body proportions for a 10 year old. Um, by the age of 10, she hasn't lost a single tooth, right? My six year old just lost her first tooth. So like, I, I can only imagine like going four more years and no teeth fell out. Um, so she's behind developmentally, I guess is the point. Um, and then the image on the far right, the treatment was initiated and she, uh, oh, I should say, at this stage, she was bone aged. So another thing that you do is you take a bone scan, you look at the epiphyseal plates to kind of get an idea of what the, what the bone age of the, of the child is. So she's 10 years chronologically with a bone age of five, okay? Um, so this is in the treated situation. You can see um, dramatically, right, she's lost weight, which isn't the only, you know, benefit here. Um, but she's actually uh, growing up uh, with respect to um, proportional growth. Now she's lost six teeth in 10 months. Um, and, um, you know, she's enjoying sort of these uh, catch-up phases of trying to get back on her normal uh, uh, growth charts. So in this case, I pose this question. Primarily, we would want to look at thyroid stimulating hormone when we saw a patient that had these symptoms. We look at thyroid stimulating hormone, you'll use scanning imaging too, but why do you look at thyroid stimulating hormone when a patient presents with the pictures on the left and those symptoms of being cold and tolerant, listless, that means no energy, um, weight gain. And so you're thinking there might be a thyroid problem, and why do you measure TSH? Ask yourselves, talk amongst yourselves. has a lot to do. So if so the, the answer that's coming back to me is, is, is correct. So let me just finish it out though. So you're going to look at thyroid stimulating hormone because you, you're suspecting that the patient is hypothyroid, right? They have all these clinical symptoms. 
And so if you measure uh, thyroid stimulating hormone and you get a high thyroid stimulating hormone level, but you have symptoms of hypothyroid, right? That's telling you that the thyroid um, is trying to respond, or the body's trying to respond, by increasing thyroid stimulating hormone. It's basically yelling at the thyroid, saying, make more. So the anti-pituitary upreg, it, it, the body detects that thyroid hormone's low, so the feedback mechanism tells the anti-pituitary to release more thyroid stimulating hormone, which is basically saying, make more to the thyroid, and the thyroid doesn't respond, okay? So that kind of gives you confirmation from a negative feedback loop that if I have hypothyroid-like symptoms and I have high TSH, that means that probably the anterior pituitary is fine, okay? And you just do a scan of the of the brain to look to make sure there wasn't an adenoma in the anterior pituitary. And then you go treat the thyroid, okay? The other side of the coin would be if you have low TSH levels, you would suspect that the thyroid itself is probably overactive. And, and so the body's saying, it's overactive, I'm gonna make less TSH and try to correct it. So when you're looking at these symptoms, having a scan of the head and TSH levels will really help you pinpoint where the problem is. Is the problem in the pituitary or is the problem in the thyroid, okay? So that's the whole point of this exercise is to try to help you analytically figure out how we, we identify where these endocrinology-like problems might, might lie. Okay, the last organ that we're gonna talk about in our remaining time is the pancreas. So strategically, I set you up. I went from top down, right? And we're not covering all of the organs in the endocrine system. We don't have time to do that. But the last one we're going to cover is the pancreas, um, which is lowest down in the abdominal cavity. And so hopefully the idea is to distinguish it from the posterior pituitary where we have diabetes insipidus issues. That's why, and, and I separate it by a big break. Because on the exam, you'd be surprised at how many students just wrestle with, I just don't remember if it was the I word or the M word. It's like, well, they mean completely different things, okay? And they're in two different parts of the bodies. So diabetes mellitus, right? I think this would be, um, uh, at least mellitus would be, would be a great name for a daughter. But my wife would trump me. Because in the Latin, di uh, mellitus means sweet like honey. Okay, isn't that, it's like a term of endearment. You should try that with your boyfriend or your girlfriend next time. Like, Elias, come on over here. <laughs> Maybe Elias is up, right? It means sweet like honey. It's a term of endearment. And diabetes means what? Siphoning. So if you're siphoning off sugar, okay, and you get a lot of sugar in the urine because there's too much sugar in the bloodstream, on ex inspection, examination, if you smelled that urine from a diabetic, that was not managed, it would smell sweet. Okay, so that's that's where this original the terminology very different than the other diabetes we talked about. So sweet like honey, siphoning off sweet like honey is what it really translates to. So diabetes mellitus is an inabil inability um, to produce insulin in appropriate physiologic levels is called type one. The inability to respond to insulin physiologically is called type 2. And we, and we call it, we, we just call it type 1 and type 2 because we hardly ever see diabetes insipidus. So it would be really DI or DM type 1, DM type 2. You with me? So <clears throat> the third kind of diabetes mellitus is actually considered gestational during pregnancy. So the type 1 classic old school literature referred to it as the childhood onset of diabetes, type 1 diabetes. But that sort of canonical or central dogma is starting to shift. It is no longer 
really term to be accurate medically to say that this is a childhood type of diabetes. Because we're, we're diagnosing more patients that are out of childhood that have type 1 diabetes. What the heck's going on there? We'll, we'll talk about it here in a second. But I just want you to be aware, you know, if you go to med school and you, know, you have like a 97-year-old professor, they may call it childhood diabetes, okay? Because that's kind of the older school terminology. Um, likewise, type 2 diabetes mellitus is considered the adult onset or adult-associated type 2 diabetes because typically it's developed later in life. So what's throwing everybody off within the medical community are type 1, classic type 1 diabetics that don't have symptoms until they're in their 20s, right? And they're like, oh, you have type 2 diabetes. And then they go measure insulin, they, they do an insulin glucose challenge, and they're like, oh, uh, uh, you actually don't make any insulin. What happened, right? Or your insulin levels are so low, that's why you're having a problem. You're not type 2, you're actually type 1. I'm so confused, okay? So that's type 1. It's more accurate to refer to it as type 1 diabetes mellitus than type 2 diabetes mellitus. And leaving the childhood and adult big off. And instead saying that type 1 is the inability to produce adequate physiologic levels, and type 2 is the inability to respond physiologically, okay? Now, gestational affects about 3 to 10 percent of pregnancies, and there's no real specific cause that we've been able, we haven't been able to really figure out what's going on like we have with 1 and 2 of diabetes and mellitus, but it's believed that the hormones during pregnancy, we always blame the hormones, by the way, um, the hormones in pregnancy increase a woman's resistance to insulin, um, resulting in impaired glucose tolerance. And so, um, sort of evolutionarily speaking, it makes sense. Right? If, if a woman is uh, feeding through their bloodstream a developing organism, it's very important for the blood flow to the organism to be rich in nutrition. And so it would be better for the organism, if you're trying to nurture, for your blood to be rich in nutrition and not all of the sugar to be in your cells. Okay? And, and hormones that fluctuate really high during pregnancy will cause a resistance to the mother so that the blood feeding the infant, the, the, the fetus, is rich in sugar. Okay? But again, there is a problem if you go too much and you have larger birth weights in the children and then you have childhood um, complications, potentially uh, diabetes within, within the infant uh, early in life. So it is kind of an issue. Uh, that we're uh, trying to pay attention to. So this diagram, uh, and this is the subsequent slides is where I've made some changes, and I'll, I'll show you where the slides are new. But this diagram's a nice one because insulin has activity on fat, muscle, and the liver. And I like these. All these terms should be familiar with you, uh, to you. Insulin to the fat, it encourages glucose uptake. It included, encourages uh, the breakdown of, of fat, and it, um, uh, or sorry, the, the development of fat, and it uh, decreases the breakdown of fat. If it's acting on skeletal muscle, it increases glucose uptake, uh, it increases uh, the production of the storage form of glucose, because you put glucose into the muscle, now you store it for later use, and then it increases the muscles to build, right? Now remember, when we look back at uh, giganticism, pituitary gigantism, and we make too much growth hormone, we make too much insulin growth factor too, because if you want to grow the, the muscles, you need more energy and protein synthesis taking place. So it makes sense that you would upregulate insulin too, okay? Thirdly, uh, with the liver, uh, insulin uh, encourages um, fat to be laid down, or the production of new fat. It um, increases uh, sugar storage in the form of glycogen, and then it slows down new glucose manufacture, uh, known as gluconeogenesis. So diagnostically, the normal glucose levels fluctuate typically between about 70 mg per deciliter to 120 milligrams per deciliter. And in diabetes mellitus, um, we would identify it as being potentially problematic if those sugar levels in the blood were higher than 200 mg per deciliter on a random draw and the patient was symptomatic, or on a fasting glucose challenge, they were 126 
milligrams per deciliter or higher, um, more than one time, did it a few times, uh, or they had an abnormal glucose tolerance test. So nowadays, the glucose tolerance test is usually quicker and more reliable, so it's the preferred method. Um, the way that this one works is a standard dose of glucose is administered to, uh, uh, to the patient, and then blood levels are checked uh, within an hour, two hours, four hours later to see kind of how they profile. So it, it also gives you an idea of not just a single moment in time, it gives you an idea of how the cells are responding over a period of time. So glucose uptake over a number of hours after a particular challenge test. So the last one is considered to be sort of the, the, new, the newest gold standard, if you will. Now this next slide is new, or updated. Um, it's a new picture. And the reason that I picked this one is because um, I kind of like the format of how it's described. And then in the second one, um, with diabetes type, mellitus type 2, I had to modify the picture because it wasn't exactly correct from Google Images, but I made it correct. Um, so, type 1 is considered an autoimmune disease. Type 1 is a hypersensitive uh, sensitivity reaction, right? Type 1 diabetes mellitus. Do you guys remember which one it was? It was type 4. Why? Because it involved T cells. It involves T cells. So, it's going to involve T helper cells, and it's going to involve cytotoxic T cells, CD8. Um, <clears throat> And there is identified as a component within type 1 diabetes a potential for antibody production. But again, as you know now, after going through all the hypersensitivities, uh, it's only classified as a type 4 if it involves T cells. It could still involve antibodies, and it's still considered type 4. Okay? Um, so you've got sort of like um, Hashimoto's disease with... Um, Type 1 diabetes mellitus. Remember, on Hashimoto's, we had kind of three different pathways because we could have an inflammatory response, we could have a helper T uh, cytotoxic T lymphocyte response, or we could have antibody production on this sort of far right pathway that we look at. Same thing can happen here. The other thing is, all of those pathways with type 1 don't have to fire up at the moment of birth. Right? So, like, if a patient uh, it, uh, uh, is, uh, is born and uh, maybe has um, some um, basal level of uh, cytotoxicity against the pancreas, the beta islet cells of the pancreas. And let's say that pancreas goes down to like 75% of normal function, right? Between the ages of, you know, nursing till 16, 17 years of age. And, they're, and, they, and they lived at home and, and, you know, mom and dad kind of, you know, you know didn't have like Mountain Dew and Doritos uh, for every meal. There was kind of a little bit more balanced food around. Um, well, their blood glucose levels were probably never really out of whack. And there could be an infection that took place. There could be a major virus that happens and the, and the patient gets extremely sick. And that little trigger point could stimulate another pathway to be activated and could take out from 75% down to say 20% and now the patient becomes symptomatic. Okay, And so we're starting to see that there are more patients in their teenage years and even into their 20s now that are being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Why? Well, all of these pathways that you know about now, whether it's an inflammatory pathway, an antibody production pathway, or a T-cell mediated pathway, not all three of them have to be turned on instantaneously in the age of two months. So they may manifest themselves later in life, okay? Um, with B-cell destruction of, of 80 to 90% um, of the pancreas, it usually leads to hyperglycemia, where you have too much sugar floating around in the bloodstream. So this little uh, schematic is showing you, here is our uh, pancreas that's producing little green um, uh, insulin structures, and they bind to the glucose, and that allows them to be uptaken into the cell. And in um, a type 1 diabetic, the immune cells, right here, but again, it could be antibodies, and it, obviously inflammation is involved too, 
um, the, the, the pancreas is being attacked, and it does not produce insulin, or, even, or maybe not enough insulin. Maybe there's some, but not enough. Um, and so now uh, no insulin uh, uh, is encouraging glucose uptake, and so the glucose stays in the bloodstream. And that's mechanistically essentially what's happening. So with type 1, and this is a slightly modified slide, I think most of it's the same, but it might be slightly different. Um, what are the symptoms? We've got the three P's, right? We've got polyuria, we have polydipsia, and we have polyphagia. Okay, so let's stop for a second. Polyuria, large production of urine, right? Why? Well, um, when there's a lot of sugar in the bloodstream, um, you get a lot of, you get an increase in urine osmolarity. And as that takes place, you push more water in to the urine to try to dilute it out. And so you lose a lot of fluid in the urine with high amounts of, of, of glucose. And that's where that sweet like honey smell or scent of urine, unmanaged diabetes mellitus type 1. That's where the score came from. Okay? Um, the, uh, this in of itself triggers the thirst centers in the brain, right? Which is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is triggered because of your osmolarity levels of your urine. And you're, you're losing a lot of water. So that's where that excessive thirst comes from. Um, the excessive um, uh, uh, hunger is um, because there, there's a lack of energy. If all the sugar is in the bloodstream, it's not in the cells. So the body is thinking, I need more calories. Uh, and so you get a trigger response of hunger as a result of it. Because there's plenty of sugar there. It's just not coming into the cells if insulin's not present. Okay? And that's where that hunger comes from. Now, if it's unmanaged, um, this is what the symptoms would look like. Okay, unmanaged, meaning type 1 diabetics are typically very good about keeping track of their insulin levels and also, or excuse me, their glucose levels and then delivering insulin doses appropriately to try to keep homeostatic norms between a certain range that they've determined by, with their doctor as being most appropriate, right? And a lot of times, the more tightly they can manage it, which means if they're more diligent about it, the, the, the better their sort of, the less comorbidities they have. Meaning, uh, not, I'm not talking about comorbidity means uh, other associated illnesses, not mortality. Mortality would be death. Uh, mortality is, death is possible with extreme cases of type 1 unmanaged diabetes as well as type 2. Okay, but usually people get help. Um, so weight loss, weight loss is going to happen and, and ketoacidosis as well as hyperglycemia Weight loss uh, will happen in type 1 diabetics because basically the cells are being starved because they can't bring in the nutrition. It's there, but they can't reach it. Okay? Again, this is unmanaged. Like, if you have friends that are, that are type 1 diabetic, um, it, they're probably fine. They're, they're managing their diabetes, and they're probably doing it very well. They probably um, know their body so well that they... Many times, I have actually a very close colleague who is a type 1 diabetic, and he'll tell me he can just tell when he needs to have a shot. Uh, he, he doesn't even really need a monitor. He'll go and usually double check so he doesn't give himself too much. But he said, uh, as long as he's kind of eating the same things, he's doing the same, you know, he's in his 50s, so he's been doing it for his whole life. But if I have the same diet, I usually can pretty much predict that I need this much at this time. And I actually don't even need my monitor. It's when I go off my diet or I have a different meal, I go out to eat, or I'm traveling, so that's the worst. You know, you're on an airplane or you're in a hotel and restaurants and all that. Um, so they, they get very good at it. Um, the ketoacidosis, this is a result of trying to find alternative sources of fuel. So if the cell can't use sugar, it's going to break down protein and fat in order to generate ATP to stay alive. So ketoacidosis is acidity as a byproduct of ketone metabolism. So when you have alternative sources of fuel like uh, uh, protein and fat, um, it, the byproduct is you get this ketoacidosis. Okay? And then hyperglycemia is high sugar level, so that's kind of, I think, an obvious um, result. 
Now, if we look at the pathogenesis, and this is a new slide, um, if we look at the pathogenesis of type 2, we're comparing and contrasting 1 versus 2, we see that this picture is a little bit different. <coughs> this is insulin resistance. And there's typically a genetic defect in either the receptor for insulin or the insulin signaling pathway. And the patient usually makes insulin. That's not really the issue. And instead of the normal pathway, the insulin that's being produced is either less, not absent, but it's either less or, and this is my modification, the cells become resistant to the insulin that is produced. And the reason that we know that this is true is we can treat a type 2 diabetic with a different type of insulin than what they make, and they actually do really well. So some of you have type 2 diabetic family or friends, you're like, how come they, I know they're, they said they were type 2 diabetic, and they give themselves insulin. Well, they're giving themselves either a synthetic or a different uh, animal source uh, uh, insulin that's not theirs, and it's more potent, and they'll actually respond to it, okay? So this pathway is one that I added to modify to the slide that I just pulled off of Google Images, because it, it doesn't really tell the whole story without that little uh, additional pathway. Now, if we look at the complications that result from type 2, right, we get overweight instead of losing weight. We get dyslipidemia. Um, we get situations of hyperinsulinemia because if they don't respond, the cells don't respond, you make more. Um, and that was one of the symptoms of that pituitary gigantism patient. Well, we'll get hypertension because there's a lot of sugar in the bloodstream. So now there's a lot of fluid that actually resides there, raising blood pressure. We'll get fatigue because there's not a source of sugar in the, in, the, in the cells, it's actually floating around the blood. And then we get what we call recurrent infections, um, foot ulcers. Um, and this is a result of damage to the vasculature that's in the lower legs as a result of high glucose levels. And that damage to the vasculature that's in the lower legs um, also reduces blood flow to the nerves. And so you get parathesis, which is the numb prick, prick, pinprick feeling, kind of that tingling feeling. And so a lot of type 2 unmanaged diabetic patients have sort of limb claudication. They have kind of pain when they walk. They have numbness and tingling of the lower limbs and extremities. And they develop these uh, uh, foot ulcers. So, uh, oh, this, I'm sorry. That should say type 2. Uh, so I borrowed the slide from here. It's the same format, and I forgot to change the title. My bad. Change that to type 2. This is type 2. Okay? I'm going to do that right now, because that makes me nervous. Okay. All right, so type 1 and type 2. Uh, diabetes. We talk about what the, what the root cause is, we talk about what's going on, and we talk about the clinical symptoms. Right? So this is where we're going to end for the exam. We're out of time. And I want to stay true to you. I don't want to, you know, be like, <laughs> okay, did you get that? But what I'm going to do is when we come back after the exam, I'm going to finish out these last few slides and so you can see the whole story. And then we'll get into um, our next section. And that new stuff over here will be on the last exam of the semester. Okay? But you're, you're responsible for everything up until this slide. And make sure you remember to change that to type 2 diabetes. I'll probably put out an email announcement because I don't want you to get confused. It's pretty obvious because you can we talk about type 1, then we talk about type 2. But I don't want to type what it confused. Alright? Have a good weekend.